Okay, on to chapter five, survey of the eukaryotic cell. We spent chapter four looking at prokaryotic cell structures and a little bit of taxonomy. And we're going to obviously now get into the eukaryotic cell, which you're certainly much more familiar with. One thing to note is that we can go back some 2 billion years to see the first eukaryotic cells on Earth. Remember, prokaryotes evolved some three and a half to four billion years ago. So these cells, the eukaryotes are coming much later. Uh, this is following the um, cyanobacteria, helping to infuse oxygen into the atmosphere. Remember us talking about that. And that paved the way for the eventual evolution of eukaryotic cells. Scientists have been hypothesizing as to how these early eukaryotic cells came to be. And from uh, a number of different um, studies and research, which was really uh, done extensively in the 1970s, a theory referred to as the endosymbiotic or endosymbion endosymbiont theory um, is the one that, that we espouse to today. And basically what it says is, if you look at today's eukaryotic cells and you examine specifically the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, that these two very important organelles of eukaryotes have very, very similar um, chemistry, similar genetics, similar um, biology to prokaryotic cells. And so what we think happened some two plus billion years ago was that a, some ancestral prokaryotic cell, perhaps it was an archaean of some sort, as we see here at the top of the uh, diagram, that it phagocytized a smaller prokaryotic cell which could have been related to this group called the rickettsias. Remember us mentioning that in the previous chapter. And somehow that particular smaller prokaryotic cell that was initially engulfed by the larger prokaryote eventually develops a mutualistic symbiosis with the larger cell. Mutualistic means that both benefit the larger cell benefits and the smaller cell benefits. Initially, it could have been somewhat of a parasitic relationship in terms of the larger cell engulfing the smaller cell, perhaps bringing it down and using it in some way. We don't really know. But we do think that at some point in time, that smaller engulfed, phagocytized prokaryote eventually gave rise to today's modern mitochondria and a different cell that was phagocytized became the modern day chloroplast. Also that ancestral larger prokaryote eventually evolves into a eukaryotic cell. And if you watch this video, it's about a, I think a one and a half to two minute video uh, we'll walk you through this process. Now, I will tell you that this particular video, unlike what we've just talked about and what the book presents, will be talking about a eukaryotic cell engulfing a prokaryote. It seems as though it was more likely a prokaryote, a bigger prokaryote, engulfing another prokaryotic cell. So I wanted to point out that particular difference uh, to you as you begin to watch this video, you're gonna notice that. So this again, um, espoused back in the 1970s by a researcher by the name of Lynn Margulis from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, very, very fascinating uh, topic that we could spend an entire course probably learning actually. So as we surveyed the eukaryotes, 
and we're going to be um, looking at those that are um, microbial in the sense that they're, they're generally smaller uh, eukaryotic cells. This sort of gives an overview of the five major categories that we're going to talk about in just a moment. The protozoa, the fungi or fungi, the algae, and the helminth worms. We'll also talk about some additional arthropods. Um, but all of these guys um, range in size from single celled, which is what of course unicellular means, to colonial, meaning there's a group of cells that forms a colony, to multicellular, larger entities, larger, I don't know if I even call them microbes, they use the term microbe, but, but as you'll see in a few minutes, these are our, our, our uh, structures, our, our cells, uh, actually the organisms made up of many cells, multicellular. Um, uh, so let's begin by talking about uh, the eukaryotic cell sort of in general. And this is a composite sketch that you see in your text. Um, no eukaryotic cell looks exactly like this. This is an artist's depiction where he or she has thrown in all of the various organelles that you've come to know and love. You've heard a lot of, of these over the years. Um, note that all eukaryotes share these common uh, organelles, while some eukaryotes have these lower five. So I'm going to just spend a few minutes um, kind of uh, talking about these. A lot of times I'm going to just ask you to read over um, certain parts of chapter five uh, because it's review for you for the most part. But we're going to, again, survey the eukaryotic cell, uh, starting with external structures and then moving uh, inward and talking about some organelles. So let's start with some external features that some eukaryotic, eukaryotic cells have, not all, but some. And what's interesting about the flagellum, which is a singular structure versus flagella, which is plural. And in this particular sketch, you can see several flagella coming from this unicellular uh, cell. And here's uh, an interesting little uh, animation that also appears to show the very same cell. You can see the two flagella sticking out here on the end of the organism. This is probably euglena, I suspect. Notice that it's also got green chloroplasts in it. That's kind of interesting. So it's photosynthetic. But again, back to the flagellum or flagella. Um, if you were to look inside this very um, motile structure, you would see microtubules. These are, are elastic, um, flexible, stretchable proteins. And as you'll see in the next slide, when we look at a cross section, um, these are oriented in what's referred to as a nine plus two arrangement. So more on this in just a moment, but just remember nine plus two arrangement of microtubules within the flagellum. Uh, you'll note that even though we talked about flagella in chapter four with regard to somehow some bacteria, of course, having it to help them move, um, it's a very different uh, structure in, in terms of the um, makeup of the flagellum. It's, it's a lot smaller, a lot thinner. We're talking about a much, much thicker flagellum in a eukaryotic cell. But functionally, it performs the same thing for a eukaryotic cell that it would for a prokaryotic cell, and that is, of course, to help the cell move through its environment. Cilia, which is the plural term here, cilium would be one, uh, is another external feature that some eukaryotic cells possess. This is not helping the cell swim like the flagellum did, but rather to, well, it depends on the cell. I, sh I shouldn't say that because I was thinking when I said that of a uh, ciliated cell that lines our trachea, for example, or that lines the fallopian tubes, right? It helps move the egg from the ovary toward the uterus. In that particular example, the cilia aren't helping the cell move because the cells are fixed, aren't they? But there are some um, single-celled organisms that you guys saw in lab, like paramecium, where the cilia can help in locomotion. So I, I need to be careful when I say that. It can, it can help the cell move, if it's a single cell protozoan like this guy is, uh, 
or it can be a fixed structure like we see here at the bottom, which helps perhaps to move materials like a mucus or an egg. It just depends on where the cilia are on the cell and where the cell is. So earlier I mentioned that in the case of a flagellum, we had an eight, or I'm sorry, a nine plus two tubular arrangement. The same basic uh, anatomy applies to the cilium. So in this lower left-hand corner, we're looking at a cross section through a cilium. So pretend we're taking a paramecium here and we're cutting through one of these little cilia. Cross section means we're cutting it at a right angle to the long axis, or we're cutting the cilium kind of like this, all right? Uh, and you can see the nine outer pairs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then the two center pairs. So there's where it gets the, the, uh, the nine plus two uh, uh, definition, if you will. And these are running down the length, these microtubules, running down the length of the cilium. Here's a longitudinal cut through the cilium. And you can sort of make out, if you look super, super close, these thin, thin uh, microtubules. So what it, of course, does is it imparts a wave action to the cilium. And that is what allows this cell to swim very efficiently and very quickly through its watery environment. If you think back again to lab, those of you that are in lab, you saw this not too long ago. And uh, they are fast swimmers. In some eukaryotic cells, we may have an outer glycocalyx. This term again should sound familiar to you because we said that some bacteria also have a glycocalyx, a sugar coat. Um, and for the most part, although the chemistry is different in eukaryotic glycocalyces versus prokaryotic glycocalyces, um, the major function is pretty much the same, and that is in helping the cell to adhere to some substrate, perhaps. It also provides some external protection to the cell. Um, and that's pretty much all I'm going to say about the glycocalyx. Many eukaryotic cells have it. Not all, but, but many. If we go beneath the glycocalyx, because remember, we're looking now at the external features of the cell. In the case of fungi and most algae, we would have underneath that glycocalyx a cell wall that we'll talk about in just a moment. In a protozoan and in a couple algae and in all animal cells, we don't have a cell wall. And I should also say at this point, the cell wall found in some eukaryotic cells is vastly different from the cell wall found in some bacterial cells, even though we use the same term. I'm sorry for the confusion there, but it is what it is. You just have to know that the cell wall in eukaryotes is different from the cell wall in prokaryotes. But it does lie external to the cell membrane. And it does have similar functions, i.e. providing uh, structural rigidity to the cell, regulating what comes in and out of the cell, and that kind of thing. So the cell wall that we said are characteristic of fungi and some algae, as I said just a second ago, provides support to the cell, provides structure to the cell. But in a eukaryotic cell wall, instead of having the peptidoglycan that we talked about in the preceding chapter, you don't have that here. You have basically a layer of polysaccharide uh, in the form of glucose bonded together to compose what is called chitin or cellulose. And the difference between chitin and cellulose within a cell wall of a eukaryote has to do with how the glucose molecules are bonded to one another. Um, and that's all I'm going to say. You don't need to worry about knowing the difference, but just maybe, maybe try to basically relate chitin and cellulose to the, the uh, makeup of the cell wall in a eukaryotic cell, in some eukaryotic cells. The cytoplasmic membrane, this is the same thing as plasma membrane or cell membrane. Um, again, you've heard of this before. You've studied it in a and and in biology in high school. It's that fluid mosaic model that's describing the phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins, right? 
Um, they don't have a sketch of it here in your book, but you can go back into the previous chapter and you can see a, a, basically an artist sketch. It's very, very similar in composition to what you'd find in a prokaryotic cell wall, a cell membrane. Now we're going to delve into the cell and talk about some of the organelles. And this is where I'm going to really not spend much time because you've heard of these organelles before. I would like you to refresh your memory as to the names of these organelles and what they do. And that's basically what the following cells do. I'd like you to also review cell division in eukaryotic cells. This is the the process of mitosis, right, that describes how the DNA is, is um, separated and, and uh, replicated within the cell. And there's a nice short little video you can watch that talks more about this, but this is, this is reviewed. The same applies to the uh, endoplasmic reticula, both rough and smooth. Check that out, review that. There's some a sketch there in your book that kind of talks about that. And basically the difference between uh, rough and smooth often boils down to the fact that the rough endoplasmic reticulum is called rough because, because if you look at a scanning electron micrograph of it, you'd see these studded ribosomes on the surface. That's what these blue structures are denoting, the presence of ribosomes. And so if we take this, we blow it up, um, we'd see the ribosomes. More on those in just a moment. But do you remember what ribosomes do? You should know. Ribosomes are the sites for protein assembly, protein synthesis. The Golgi apparatus or Golgi body, some books will use that term, is basically taking uh, materials that were produced in the, in the uh, ER, and here comes a transport vesicle that's butted off of this organelle, and it heads to the Golgi apparatus, which looks like a bunch of stacked pita plates, doesn't it? Pita bread. And there, the uh, material that's produced here becomes modified or stored. Eventually, it can um, be exported from the Golgi apparatus. And that's what's happening here at the bottom. These are, again, little transport vesicles that bud off of the, the, uh, the export side, if you will, of the organelle. These can be used internally. Um, the, the, the byproducts here that were uh, stored, modified chemically, um, ready to be used by the cell, or they could even um, be exported from the cell too. And that's what's kind of shown here. So there's a well-orchestrated process within the cell, lots of biochemistry going on. All these organelles work together, if you will, to provide functionality to the cell. They're absolutely critical. Lysosomes, vacuoles, phagosomes, please review those, have a sense of what those are. Check out the short little minute or two video through this hyperlink. It'll talk about lysosomes and how they help to break down food. There'll basically be a video of this set of sketches. So check it out. Very interesting um, organelles produced by the Golgi. Mitochondria, here's our powerhouse organelle. We've talked about it a lot in A&P, and again, if you're taking bio, you've heard of it. The uh, infoldings here of the inner mitochondrial membrane, you can see those here. These are the cristae, the increased surface area that they provide is important for the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle to occur. I'm not gonna review that now, but it's, absolutely critical for aerobic respiration. This is the this is the organelle that the cell uses to make lots of ATP. Without ATP, without energy, the cell dies. If the cell dies, the organism dies if it's made up of cells. Note here that it does indicate that this organelle can divide independently of cells, that it contains its own unique DNA, and it contains ribosomes that are similar in size to those found in prokaryotes. This again lends evidence to the endosymbiotic theory that we alluded to earlier in the lecture. Chloroplasts, which of course are important for photosynthesis because they contain these 
these stacked plates called thylakoids. They look like dinner plates, don't they? Stacked together within the thylakoids are the pigments, the chlorophylls, um, and various other photosynthetic pigments. That's why the organelle looks green. Um, plants have chloroplasts. You see my T has been cut off here on the, on the uh, slide. I'll have to fix that. That should read found in algae and plant cells. Um, so if you are utilizing the sun's energy, you're going to have chloroplasts. Um, note the presence again of ribosomes and DNA in this organelle, like we saw in the mitochondrion. This again provides evidence for the endosymbiotic endosymbiosis theory, right? That we've talked about. Um, ribosomes, again, this is where proteins are assembled during translation. Um, it's mostly composed of ribosomal RNA and various proteins. Each ribosome has a large and small subunit. And as it indicates here, the ribosome in a eukaryotic cell is different from the ribosome in the prokaryote in terms of its chemistry. Okay, we won't get into the differences other than the fact that the Ribosome is bigger in a eukaryotic cell than it is in a prokaryote, but both uh, cells will utilize it to help link those amino acids together, as we're seeing occur here in the process of translation. If you forgot about what translation is, go back in your ANP book. Chapter four of whole has that. Cytoskeleton, we talked about that a little bit in the uh, uh, bacteria chapter, prokaryotic cell chapter. This is an internal array of uh, proteins called microfilaments and microtubules that provide internal structure to the cell. Internal structure. So we see here in this uh, fluorescent uh, stain, here's the nucleus of a cell in blue and um, the, uh, the filaments here in yellow shown by the fluorescent dye. It's a pretty cool photograph, providing basic internal structure. And in some case, in some case of some cells, can provide for movement. As you'll learn about later in the chapter, um, amoeboid movement, think of amoeba, maybe you've heard of those single cell protozoa that move through their watery environment to extend their, their cell membrane. And that extension, that movement of the cell is imparted thanks to the presence of these microfilaments and microtubules within the cell. Also, organelles can be moved around actually within the cell through the action of some cytoskeletal proteins. Here we have an overview, a nice uh, table that kind of compares the prokaryotic cells and the eukaryotic cells and even the viruses, which is going to be chapter six of our book, with regard to um, what characteristics do they share? And there aren't many that all three share, but one that they do is the presence of DNA and RNA. All three of them have that. But uh, I'm not going to go through this entire chap or table, but as you peruse through this, this is going to make more sense to you because you've already talked about, uh, we've talked about the prokaryotic cells. We'll talk about eukaryotes in chapter five, and we'll get into viruses in six. So when we get done with six, you can come back to this table and look at it, and it's going to make a, a much more sense to you. But you might want to check out these, these two particular columns right now, or when you get done looking at chapter five. It's a great table. OK, so let's begin to survey these eukaryotic microbes. Again, we use the term microbe in a loose sense, because some of these are actually pretty large. Most eukaryotic cells, as you know, are bigger than bacteria. And uh, this somewhat follows um, what we did in lab uh, not too long ago, where we kind of surveyed these major groups of eukaryotes. And so we'll talk about fungi, algae, protozoa, and parasitic helminth worms for the duration of chapter five. This particular lecture will include the fungi, and then I'll do the second half of chapter five, 
um, and talk about algae, protozoa, and the helminths. So fungi, really interesting group of eukaryotic cells. The, the term kingdom, and remember, is a taxon. It's a term to describe a taxonomic level or strata, stratum, within which we have 100,000 plus known species of fungi, ranging in size from those that we can see when we take a walk in the woods, for example. You've all seen mushrooms, and, and maybe some of you know what puffballs are. You, you often see these or notice them more in the fall. When you touch them, they, they puff, they release their spores, and they're dried up at that point. Um, but there's a lot of fungi that are microscopic that we would need a microscope to see. Not all, but, but the yeasts, for example, are so tiny, you need a microscope. Some molds, as we'll see in just a moment, uh, you can find in your refrigerator or uh, on the uh, shower curtain, perhaps. Right? So they may not necessarily be microscopic in that sense, but to see the cells, we'd have to obviously uh, use the scope. The majority are unicellular, meaning one cell or colonial cells working together uh, in a colony. Um, there aren't a whole lot of, um, well, there are multicellular forms too, I guess colonial by definition, more than one cell. Uh, but a lot of the smaller ones, in particular the yeasts, are unicellular. The, the molds tend to be colonial, as we'll see. Now, so again, I think we've all had the experience of opening up our fridge and opening up that jar of spaghetti sauce that was put way in the back that we forgot about. It's been sitting there for, for uh, a couple of weeks. You pull it out, open up the lid, look inside, and you see this beautiful array of greens and, and yellows and blues, and maybe just a little bit of that spaghetti sauce underneath, <laughs> white, right, fuzzy stuff. Yeah, so there has obviously been some, some growth going on. Even in the refrigerator, which we often think as a good place to put stuff to kind of continue its uh, preservation, and it certainly helps to preserve foods, but there will come a point in time where even uh, a cold refrigerator with enough time and enough nutrients can provide suitable growing conditions for lots of different kinds of fungi and bacteria too, for that matter. So let's talk first about a group of fungi called the yeasts. And when you think of yeast, you probably think of what you go to the store and buy if you're gonna make cinnamon rolls or bread, or maybe you, can, you know of a yeast infection, which is not uncommon in women, right? Um, there's a whole lot of different kinds of yeasts, but all of them share somewhat similar uh, morphology in the sense that they are small oval shaped cells. And so here we see a scanning electron micrograph of some stained yeast cells. Uh, here's obviously a, a cutaway view of a sketch that somebody's made of a yeast cell and we can see all of those various organelles that we uh, saw earlier in the chapter. Uh, sketched here. And what this yeast cell is doing is it's undergoing a process called budding. This is also shown here in the lower half of the slide. And we had a chance to see budding take place in lab, didn't we? So this is the way, the primary way that many yeasts will reproduce when conditions are, are good. By that I mean plenty of moisture, plenty of uh, organic materials, plenty of sugars to metabolize, um, and again, this is an asexual process. What that means is that any cell that is formed, like, like, like is going on here, so here's a bud coming off the parent cell, and then it in turn produces a bud of its own. All three of these cells are genetically identical to one another. That's what asexual means. They're genetically identical. So there's, there's no... Um, production of chromosomes and um, uh, splitting of chromosomes. This is, this is not the process we're discussing. Uh, it's a little bit different, but nonetheless, the resulting cells that are made are identical to one another. The mechanism is a little different than we see in, say, mitosis. Okay, 
we're going to talk more about the molds, another group of fungi that are a little more complex in terms of their structure. I would say they're more, they're more diverse also. There's more types of molds than there are yeasts. And what characterizes a mold from a yeast is basically the fact that in molds, you have a spore forming structure. The spores then germinate into small, thin filamentous structures called hyphae, hyphae. And here we can see uh, a sketch of some, some hyphae. This is, this is uh, the, the brown, the filamentous looking uh, root-like structure. These are not roots, so be careful. Plants have roots. These are not plants. These are fungi. So these thin filamentous structures, the hyphae, form when the spore germinates. And here's another scanning electron micrograph magnified 1,200 1200 times, and you can see the gray filamentous hyphae. Now, when those hyphae eventually um, get to a certain size, we would refer to that mass as a mycelium. And that is something that you can sometimes see with the naked eye. That would be sort of a fuzzy looking material, whether that's on the surface of your spaghetti sauce in the fridge or growing on a log uh, in the woods, right? Um, you can see that, that kind of cottony fuzzy material, that's likely a mycelium a dense network of hyphae. Now, those hyphae can come in two different major categories, if you will. And that's what we're looking at here, the vegetative type and the reproductive type. And I think the terms sort of tell you kind of what goes on. Reproductive hyphae are going to be involved in the ultimate production of spores that are going to continue the life cycle of that mold. A vegetative type of hypha or hyphae is the plural term, okay, AE is plural. Um, these are going to help in the absorption of nutrients from the surroundings. So in that sense, they're plant root-like in terms of their function. All fungi, and I'm talking here primarily about molds, although I guess you could put yeasts in this category as well, are heterotrophic, meaning in order to obtain their nutrients, they have to assimilate organic compounds. Autotrophic means you can, you can get your own energy by utilizing, say, the sun's energy, or you can utilize the um, earth's energy, if you will, like the archaea that we talked about back in, in those deep ocean trench communities. Um, you are heterotrophic. You have to, you have to uh, assimilate food, you have to ingest food, you have to take materials in, and then your cells will, will digest that intracellularly and utilize it. Fungi are the same way. They have to obtain their, their food, if you will, their organic or molecules from their surroundings. And a lot of times fungi do that by helping to decompose organic materials, dead plants, dead animals. So the term saprobe, of course, defines that process. And so even though we often focus on the harmful pathogenic aspects of fungi, um, and, and we do that to some extent on this slide, of course, in the lower left or lower right-hand corner, you can see that. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But let's not lose sight of the fact that fungi are extremely beneficial to us as well. They are the primary decomposers. If we didn't have fungi breaking down organic dead organisms, with the help of bacteria, it would accumulate. It would be a big issue. So they're extremely important in helping to recycle vital nutrients back into our ecosystems, whether it's in the oceans or in on land. Terrestrial or aquatic ecosystems make use of fungi. Um, some are paras parasitic, some are, are are causing harm to other tissues. They're using those other tissues as nutrient sources. So the term mycoses, as we'll uh, learn more about later when I give you a table that looks at various fungal infections, um, would define those particular types of disorders or infections or diseases 
that we can trace back to parasitic types of fungi. <clears throat> and one that is a rather benign uh, infection that uh, doesn't really kill you, but it is a problem, is athlete's foot. This fungus is growing on our cells, on our tissues, where we provide, again, this moist, warm environment. Right? And you can see some of the hyphae here. Kind of interesting. So let's talk a little bit about reproduction of fungi. And I'll be talking primarily about molds here. We mentioned earlier in the preceding slide or so that we had reproductive and vegetative hyphae. Vegetative, again, helping to um, bring in um, food from the surroundings. And reproductive hyphae helping in the formation of spores. We can talk about asexual reproduction in molds like we did just a moment ago in the yeasts. In the yeast, it was through the process of budding, if you recall. Um, in asexual reproduction, whether it occurs in yeast or molds, the resulting cells produced and the resulting hyphae made from those spores would be exactly identical genetically to the structure that formed from them. So there's no difference in genetics. So don't forget that. Asexual meaning no difference in the genetics of the resulting cells and structures formed. So in this particular sketch, we have a strawberry that's going bad. We have spores that have, have been released from reproductive hyphae that form what are called sporangial uh, spores off of these little sporangia. So these are elevated microscopic little pom-poms called sporangia, that's the plural. One would be called a sporangium. So there are two sporangia shown here. When the sporangia release their spores, as they're doing here, and if that spore falls on a suitable substrate, <clears throat> like the strawberry or an adjacent strawberry, it will germinate into initially vegetative hyphae to help absorb nutrients from the substrate, in this case, the strawberry. But a time will come when the hyphae, which are basically growing in the strawberry on the surface, will form structures that tend to stick out, these surface hyphae. And it's the surface hyphae that will in turn produce the reproductive hyphae, okay? So there's reproductive and there's vegetative. Reproductive hyphae tend to produce these spore forming structures while the vegetative hyphae tend to be embedded in the substrate. And in this particular example, if this was asexual, which it could be, the resulting reproductive hyphae are genetically identical to the vegetative hyphae. Let's talk about sexual reproduction. In this particular example, right, or any example of sexual reproduction, the resulting organism or tissue made is genetically unique. So here we're going to be talking briefly about how that might occur in what's called black bread mold. That's what's shown here, obviously. You can see why it's called black bread mold. It's rhizopus. Those of you that have, have had lab, we talked about this you know, some weeks ago. So growing on the surface of that bread left in the loaf in your fridge for, for three weeks or three months, you pull it out, it's green. What the heck's going on? Well, if you were to look at this under the microscope, which we did, I had you all look at that, you noticed the presence of sporangia. Little dark structures on stalks. You saw those. And you can see them if you look super close here. These little black structures are the sporangia. The sporangia are releasing the spores which are carried through the air if they fall on suitable substrate, and let's pretend it's another piece of bread nearby or another part of the piece of bread, then those spores will germinate into hyphae. And they will form two different kinds of hyphae. 
One's called a plus and one's called a minus. And all you need to know is that these are genetically different from one another because these spores are genetically different from one another. When these two unlike strains called mating strains, when they merge, the two haploid cells, haploid meaning they have half the number of chromosomes, they will combine to form a diploid zygospore. So this structure here in the very center, which is shown here in the uh, compound light microscope photo, this is called the zygospore. This was once either a minus or a plus mycelium. Here was the other minus or plus, opposite strains that came together. Their nuclei fused. So now we have what's called a diploid state. That zygospore matures, and from it sprouts a sporangium. And here you can see the sporangia. There are several here in, in red. You guys saw that in labs and slides of that. Here's the stalk in light pink. And so we've completed sort of the life cycle. We, we've alternated between what's called the haploid state and the diploid state. So these spores that are made as a result of sexual reproduction and the process of meiosis is really what helps to ensure that those spores produced are not only haploid, but they're genetically identical to, are genetically different from one another. They're unique. They're very, very unique as a result of shuffling of the genes. Again, meiosis. So what, mycologists will do, which are scientists who study fungi, in order to help identify and classify fungi is they'll look at the spore forming structures, they'll look at the life cycle of the fungus, they'll do other advanced genetic testing to help them in the process of understanding not only how to classify this particular fungus, but also perhaps how it might be related or not related to other types of fungi, and you can get an idea of their evolution that way as well. So here's a, a group of um, molds called ascomycetes. It's the term they use, ascomycete. Um, the ASCII, where the term ascomycete comes from, are these little sacs that you see here. They're microscopic, and these microscopic sacs contain the ascospores that would have been formed as a result of meiosis occurring. Now, I'll take you back to this idea that you have to have a minus and a plus mycelia coming together, or hyphae. And that's what's happened here. So this is sexual reproduction. Those um, two nuclei will eventually fuse and undergo meiosis to form these haploid spores shown here as red and blue structures. So they're released into the environment. And if they fall in suitable substrate, can germinate into hyphae. And if they come into contact with opposite mating strains, can eventually form this, what's called a fruiting body, which you can see with the naked eye. If you go into the woods or take a walk around your yard in the summer or spring or even fall, you can see these, these interesting um, cup fungi. They're sometimes called cup fungi too. They, they look like cups and they come in different colors. I've seen uh, yellow ones like this. I've seen the pretty red ones. There's orange, there's brown. They come in different colors. Um, uh, this is a truffle. You've heard of truffles maybe. This is not chocolate truffles or anything. This is fungal truffles, which you pay big money for. Um, in the olden days in France, they used to use pigs to dig up truffles. Now they've trained dogs to, to seek them out because the price that a farmer can get, if he goes onto his property and can, can dig up truffles, he can make a lot of money. These go, these go for big bucks. Um, this particular uh, mushroom, you, you would certainly identify it as a mushroom, um, is a type of ascomycete. These little structures that you see here on the surface of this morel, those are the little cups. So rather than just one cup, right, you've got, you've got maybe hundreds of cups, if you will, 
on the surface of this fruiting body. This is what pops out of the ground. We get a, a warm rain in May. These usually appear in late May, late April into the first half of May, generally. These are very, very uh, delicious mushrooms, by the way. Very sought after. I used to collect them a lot when I was growing up in Iowa in the spring of the year. I've never found them in New York. And I've been in the woods a lot. I've never seen them. So it must be a soil uh, thing. They don't have the proper soils here like they do in the Midwest. And then here would be, of course, um, a, a type of mold that you and I would recognize as a mushroom. This is another group or category. Um, so we had the ascomycetes a moment ago. Those were the, the cup fungi. Um, these are called basidiomycetes um, or club fungi. And I'll, sh I'll tell you where it got the name club fungi in just a moment. But this is what you're typically seeing when you take a walk or you look out in your yard and you see mushrooms sprouting from your lawn. That is of this group, the basidiomycete group of fungi. So being released from the gills here of these fungi would be spores. So here's the spores released. If they fall on suitable substrate, right, they will germinate. They'll form hyphae. And if you get unlike mating strains, meeting or merging, these would be haploid, so you'd have half the chromosomes, you would form a diploid mushroom eventually. You'd form mycelia after the hyphae eventually begin to intertwine. So the mycelium would grow in the ground in this particular example, if we think of this mushroom perhaps. And then a point would come in time when a little button would form and then literally within a day or two, uh, you'd see a stalk forming and a cap that would contain the gills that we said is where the spores produce are produced, right? So let's take this gilled mushroom or this one or this one, take any one you want. And if we look at it under the microscope, we would see, of course, the, the spores here, which are the colored structures, but they form on the surface of these structures called basidia. And those are the clubs. That's where I got the name club fungi because I'm sure when somebody looked at this under the microscope, these structures right here, these kind of brown tan structures, they look like little clubs. And on the tips of the clubs would be the spores that form. And when they're mature, they're released, obviously, as you can see here, and the air would carry those spores many, many miles, perhaps. And if they fell on suitable substrate, we would repeat this process again. So meiosis is taking place within the, the cap here, within the gills of the fungus, so that the spores produced, again, would be haploid. They'd have half the number of chromosomes. We could spend an entire course on fungi. Spend your whole life studying them. So they're Pretty interesting things. This table um, that I'm showing you here, or a list, I guess, um, kind of breaks down the major types of fungi. Um, I'm not so concerned that you know these words. You've heard me mention ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. That's kind of what this is referring to. Um, so again, I'm not asking you to memorize these terms. Um, but realize that these are phyla, so they fall under the term kingdom, which is a taxonomic term, phylum. Um, I do want to spend a little time talking about a group uh, of fungi related to um, impacting a particular group of organisms. I'm talking about bats. Before I get to that though, um, what this is kind of just talking about is the, the detrimental aspects of fungi. Uh, again, we know that some of them cause infections. You can be allergic to different kinds of fungi. They can be toxic. If you eat uh, the wrong mushroom, it can kill you. Uh, and that's what's described in the very first part of chapter five and then in the introduction page. So check that little um, story they talk about of the 
family eating the poisonous mushrooms. Yeah, you can get sick, you can die from eating the wrong ones. The toxins are very, very strong in certain types. Um, we lose billions of dollars uh, of crops every year due to fungal and um, spoilage. That's what that's kind of getting at. But what I wanna, again, talk a little bit about and what I wanna have you check out is this link to an article that talks about a particular fungus and its um, connection to a disorder in bats called white nose syndrome. This was first discovered in the, in the 80s and really did a job on, on bats. And uh, that's what this article kind of talks about. The bats would, would get a white nose um, uh, because the fungus would grow there. And bats normally spend their uh, winter time in, in also in the early spring and late fall in caves, in big hibernacula, they're called. So thousands and thousands and thousands of bats are, are hanging there uh, in the winter time with very, very low metabolism. As you can imagine, they can't, they're not feeding, there's no insects to be caught. So they're in hibernation, sort of, but they're not like dead, they're still alive, obviously, but their metabolism is really, 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 really low. Well, as a result of this fungal infection, um, it sort of wakes the bats up and the bats kind of scratch where that fungus is growing on them. And as a result, they're using energy. They're not in this dormant torpor state. They're in uh, a little more active state. They're not, they're not flying around, but they're, they're waking up and they're moving. And the, the effect is that they deplete their energy stores and by the time spring comes, they run out of energy and they die. Um, what we've noticed in the last 10 or 20 years um, is that bats appear to be making a comeback, that they uh, have um, begun to evolve mechanisms such that they can fight off the infection of the fungus. So that's a good thing. But there are still some species of bats um, that are still at a bit of a risk um, from this particular group of fungi. What I want to talk uh, about next as we sort of begin to wrap up this first half of chapter five is the role that certain types of fungi have had on amphibians because there's been a real reduction in the number of amphibia on earth, most notably in the tropics. However, this can happen in temperate areas like we live as well. Um, but it was first discovered in the tropics and probably because in the tropics, you have really gorgeous colored frogs. They're just magnificent, beautiful organisms. And so people began to see that there weren't as many frogs, that their numbers had declined. And so scientists began to study this and they discovered that the decline in amphibian numbers was due to a fungus called the chytrid fungus. And this disorder that they've discovered is referred to as chytridiomycosis. Mycosis meaning fungal infection. Chytridio <clears throat> comes after this group of fungi called the chytrid fungi. And that was listed as one of those five groups in one of those slides about five back, if you remember. So what uh, herpetologists have found is that a particular type of aquatic chytrid fungus, whose name I am not going to try to pronounce, but we're just gonna call it BD for short. So this is the genus, this is the species. So BD, this fungus, likes to live on the skin of amphibians. And what it acts to do on the adult frogs is it forms a plate, a patchy, patchy like plate on the underside, on the ventral surface of the adult frog. And the skin becomes keratinized. In other words, it becomes hardened. Now, you might know that frogs generally live where there are uh, moist environments, lakes, ponds, swamps, that kind of thing, right? 
they need water. You can't put a frog out in the middle of a parking lot in the middle of summer and expect it to live very long. It's going to dry out. It's going to die. And that's because it absorbs water through its ventral surface and its pelvic patch. Not only does it absorb water through that ventral surface and pelvic patch, but it also helps to breathe. Now, it has lungs, but there is gas exchange taking place here as well. So what they discovered, and as you can see on this particular photograph of the pelvic patch of this frog, is that it's got this infection of BD. And the keratinized cells impede the ability of moisture and gases to move across. So the animal dies. It, it can't absorb water. It can't get proper gas exchange. It kills the frog, the adult. To make matters worse, herpetologists have discovered that BD also targets the larval form of the frog. You might know it as a, you know, the tadpole is a larval form. The tadpole eventually forms into the adult through the metamorphic process. Think back grade three, you, you learned about tadpoles and frogs. So here, here we're looking at the, at, the, at the face, the mouth of a tadpole, all right? This is the mouth right here. And what we're noticing here, what herpetologists discovered was that the BD causes dekeratinization of the mouth parts, the cells that make up the mouth part. Now, we saw a moment ago in the adult, it promoted keratinization of the pelvic patch and ventral surface. Here, it's dekeratinizing. It's removing the keratin, which is a protein. And if you can't have a keratinized mouth part as a tadpole, you can't break off and bite vegetation that you're living on as you grow. And so the animal, the tadpole, can't get enough food, can't, can't eat. As a result, it dies. So the chytridiomycosis has really been a problem um, in the tropics, but also in other parts of the world as well. And so this a map is showing um, documented areas of uh, chytridiomycosis. Notice again, the tropics lie. Here's the equator lies right about here. So the tropics are defined as uh, 20 degrees north and south. The Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn sort of defined tropics. So uh, it would be kind of in this zone right here. But note that this is found in elevated, uh, or not elevated, but in, in much higher latitudes, up into Alaska even, they've seen it in Canada and in Europe. And the reason there's nothing here is because it probably hasn't been studied. Uh, here's, of course, Australia, Southern Africa, um, it's all over the world. Here we're looking at Costa Rica and, and Panama. So we're, we're, we're going down in this part of Central America. Um, I've traveled to Costa Rica uh, almost a dozen times. And so um, I've seen this as well. So this country right here, this is Costa Rica. Uh, it borders Panama uh, on its Eastern flank. Um, and so this is part of Panama. This is the Atlantic Ocean, this is the Pacific Ocean down below. And so what this does is it, it takes a look at how fast the spread of chytrid occurred in Central America. So here we are in 1987, just entering the northwestern corner of Costa Rica from um, uh, Nicaragua is right here. Uh, and then in a span of you know, less than what, six years? Here we are nine years later, and then by, by 20, 2006, you know, it's through most of Panama. And uh, it has really caused a huge decline in, in frog populations. Certain frogs have really uh, been hit hard by this. However, the, the good news is that like the white nose uh, syndrome in bats, what we're starting to see in some species of frogs is that populations that survived the initial onslaught and for whatever reason were able to fight off chytrid fungi uh, are making a comeback. So, so there are some, some positives here. But as a result of this, a lot of countries have had to go into the field and, and capture living frogs in an effort to try to protect them. Because if they didn't do that, odds are it could wipe them out completely. And so there are some captive breeding programs um, 
in Panama especially um, that have been somewhat successful in, in maintaining the population in a, in a laboratory setting, for, you know, growing them, breeding them. Um, and you can treat them a little bit better, uh, obviously in a laboratory with the ultimate ho hope that you can then reintroduce them back into the wild once the cases of uh, chytridiomycosis has, have, have kind of gone. So that you need to monitor, you know, the, the prevalence of it in the natural environment before you reintroduce um, the animals. And so we come down to an ethical, moral sort of question, and that is, you know, what species do we decide to save and which do we not? Because it's very expensive to, to take an animal out, put it into a laboratory, captively breed it and provide it with all the aquaria and the food. It's terribly expensive. Uh, it's just kind of something to think about. But as a result uh, of the chytriomycosis, this particular frog is thought to have become extinct as a result, unfortunately. It's a beautiful, beautiful animal. Well, uh, we've said earlier that fungi have a lot of beneficial um, characteristics and properties. Um, probably the best one would be to think about its role as a decomposer, both in a terrestrial environment, like we see here with the mushrooms growing on this tree. Um, this tree might still be alive, actually, but eventually it will die. And these fungi and others will help to decompose that tree. It may take decades and decades, but eventually um, those nutrients will be brought back into the soil and new trees will form. Um, here we have an aquatic uh, environment with a, a dead salmon along the edge of the, the stream. And there are fungi that will uh, break it down also. Uh, releasing those nutrients back into the ecosystem. So very, very important role as decomposers. Uh, as you know from lab, there are a lot of beneficial fungi um, that we can thank um, that allow us to develop certain types of antibiotics like penicillin, because penicillium is a type of mold that has been used since the 1920s to produce that antibiotic called penicillin. In fact, there are a lot of natural antibiotics produced by both uh, fungi and bacteria that we uh, utilize today. More on that coming up in a future chapter. Um, we grow fungi in the laboratory, in industry, to produce a variety of useful chemicals in, that we uh, you know, include in our foods or in our medicines. Um, in our lives today. We, we culture bacteria all the time. Um, beer, alcoholic beverages, right, are, are produced as a result of yeast action. Um, champagne, most alcoholic beverages produced by yeasts. If you look at the ingredients of your soft drink, it probably says citric acid somewhere. It's one of the common ingredients. Citric acid, most of this industrial citric acid is coming from fungi. Yeah. And if you like soy sauce, and, and I'm not sure what taco is. It's obviously some sort of a product. I'm not exactly sure how it's used, but uh, I do know soy sauce. I like soy sauce that comes from a fungus. Um, and I'll sort of finish up this uh, lecture by having you check out this table 5.6 that goes over some different major fungal infections that we as humans suffer from, ranging from a somewhat innocuous athlete's foot uh, to yeast infections that most females suffer from at some point in their lives or many times in their lives, right? This is the species of bacteria or of uh, fungi that cause it. Candida is the genus. This is all the kinds of the species. Um, so some of these impact outer parts of our body. Um, others can be more systemic, getting into our lungs or into our skin. Notice that respiratory system is often the one that's most impacted because you're inhaling the spores typically, which then germinate into hyphae and mycelia in your lungs. Yeah, it can pretty be some nasty uh, lung infections where fungi can get in there and cause problems. Um, 
So if you want to learn more about some of these lung infections, you can, you can check this out. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Uh, we'll spend the second half of lecture in chapter five talking about um, algae and protists, protozoa, and helminth worms.